This is Thought in Motion, a series dedicated to the seminars of psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. Today's video covers lectures 14 to 19 in Seminar 5. Part 3 of Seminar 5, covered today, entitled The Significance of the Phallus, develops several key concepts and central claims. And in this video, I'll discuss some of them from each lecture in order of their appearance here. Beginning with Lecture 14, where Lacan begins by reminding us of the fundamental claim made throughout the seminar, which is that desire is always intertwined with signifiers. This involves two related assertions. First, that the original object of desire is itself transformed by these signifiers. And second, that this intertwining of desire and signifiers means that desire itself is alienated. This is because what gets articulated in signifiers always originates from another place, the other, where those signifiers are created. This alienation forms the basis for the unconscious, as the subject's being is divided between a desire that cannot be expressed in speech and a desire that can and that is manifested as a demand. Lacan suggests that the mother functions as the child's first symbolized object, while the father creates signifiers. The presence or absence of the original caregiver impacts whether the child feels desired, and this triggers the child to strategize on how to become the object of its caregiver's desire, leading to a desire for the desire of the other. This pursuit introduces a third position between child and mother or child and caregiver, the position of the phallus, representing that caregiver's desire. The child then continuously tries to simplify this triad through strategies such as identifying with the phallus or identifying the mother with it. This can lead to all sorts of perversions later on in life. Another strategy in avoiding this path is that the child must accept the impossibility of any kind of identification with the phallus. This realization allows the phallus to be seen then as a symbol of lack rather than something that is present or that is communicating an imagined sense of wholeness. From here, Lacan transitions into the notion of comedy in its historical, cultural, and societal significance and its distinctive characteristics. He describes it as initially produced for the community, serving as a reflection of the human condition and all the intricate dynamics of relationships. This communal aspect is linked to the ceremonial value of performances, drawing parallels between the theater and religious rituals such as the mass. A contrast is drawn between comedy and tragedy, where tragedy focuses on the fatalistic relationship with speech and the law of signifiers, while comedy investigates alternative relationships to speech, often providing a lighter perspective on the human condition. Lacan is highlighting the role of comedy here to reveal the subject's relationship with their own significations which emerge through the interplay of signifiers. Notably, the emergence of the phallus in comedy is emphasized, linking it to the signifying order, and implying that comedy provides a distinctive way for individuals to explore and articulate their desires, identities, and connections to the symbolic world in a way that's sometimes not permitted in ordinary speech. We then transition to Lecture 15, where Lacan addresses how the link between desire and signifiers produces a fundamental split in the subject's being and existence. Now, one way to get our minds wrapped around this separation might be the following. When I die, I will no longer exist. But my being will persist, at least as a signifier, that being my name, in others' memories. My being, as defined by Lacan, doesn't then wholly rely on my living existence. And the real crux of the matter here is that this divide that I'm talking about has already occurred to the extent that the signifier has claimed me and led a life of its own. So I don't have to wait until death for the divide between being and existence to be something meaningful in the life of the subject. And this is what 
we refer to as the unconscious, the life of a of being marked by a signifier that has an independent life from my existence. This explains why Lacan says, the fate of a human subject is essentially tied to this relationship with his sign of being, which is the object of all kinds of passions and presentifies death in the process. In this link to this sign, the subject is, in effect, sufficiently detached from himself to be able to have this apparently unique relationship to his own existence and creation. The divide between being and existence aligns with another, that being the gap between a subject's desire and demand. A child's growth is deeply connected now to the mother's desire, represented by the phallus. How the child navigates this relationship determines the fulfillment of their own desire, often necessitating some kind of partial renunciation and the conversion of that desire into a demand that is structured within a set of signifiers. Desire only succeeds then in being satisfied on the condition of this partial renunciation, which is essentially what is initially elaborated by saying what it has to become is a demand. That is a desire expressed through the intervention of signifiers, or in other words, a partially alienated desire. We then move into lecture 16. And here we go deeper into the role of the phallus in psychoanalysis, emphasizing its significance as a signifier within the symbolic order that is crucial for the development of human desire and subjectivity. Here, Lacan differentiates between the ego and the ego ideal, emphasizing that the ego ideal, unlike the ideal ego, plays a significant role in depressive and aggressive functions within the psyche. And such functions are the result of a conflictual relationship between the ego ideal and the ego. Lacan further underscores the intertwined nature of intrasubjectivity and intersubjectivity, arguing that the ego ideal emerges from late identification processes involving desire, rivalry, aggression, and hostility. Now, along with being distinct from the ideal ego, Lacan also, and in a vague manner, distinguishes the ego ideal from the superego, suggesting that the ego ideal has some kind of classificatory role in the subject's desire and is crucial in the adoption of one's sexual identity, whereas the superego seems to be more aligned with the pronouncement of a prohibition or demand that comes from the other. Lecture 17 appears to be a quite significant one throughout the whole seminar as it presents to us the formulas of desire, which aren't really explicitly mentioned until the third part of this lecture. And there's not a lot of elaboration here about what everything means. I'm going to do my best here to try to articulate what I think is meant by these formulas, which I'll be presenting here on the screen to illustrate what I'm saying. Now he begins lecture 17, revisiting the concepts of identification and the formation of the ego ideal in relation to the resolution of the Oedipus complex, stating that the ego ideal originates from the subject's interaction with signifiers in the other, which he calls here insignias. We then shift into the symbolic concept of castration, which is fundamentally about the relationship between desire and a symbolic mark. The mark is necessary for the maturation of desire. Now, this mark, most notably represented in, say, the cultural practice of circumcision, is not just a sign of identity or belonging, but also it underpins the function of signifiers in their relationship with desire, much in the way that we've already discussed in terms of its implications of that for the distinction between being and existence. To acquire the mark entails halting the constant slippage of significations that overwhelms the subject and requiring that subject to give up something of itself so as to get back in exchange a stable place within reality. So to give up something of being so that one can meaningfully exist in the world. And then finally, Lacan moves on to the formulas of desire. And again, while he doesn't fully explain each formula, it seems that he aims to illustrate specific pathways on the graph of desire in a more dynamic way. So the first formula signifies the imaginary constitution of desire. 
The second represents the symbolic assumption of desire that gives rise to the ego ideal. And the third formula indicates desire after it has undergone castration, leading the imaginary phallus to be elevated to the level of a signifier. So turning to formula one, we have to appreciate this formula by realizing that human desire is not some linear relationship with an object. It's a layered interaction where satisfaction is derived from the act of desiring itself, which is often itself masked. And we can see this reflected here where desire is directed toward the relationship of a split subject with little a, around which desire revolves. This split subject indicates that we're dealing with the unconscious level. However, we see a bidirectional connection between this a here and the small a on the right hand side. The distinction between the two a's I think here is critical because they seem to be the same letter so they must mean the same thing. I think that the small letter a on the left represents the unconscious repressed remnant of some primordial object following castration. And to appreciate that we have to understand that these formulas are not some developmental stage where formula one happens first and then two and then three but they're all intertwined with one another such that castration as portrayed in uh, formula three is already implied within what's going on in formula one and vice versa now in contrast the a on the right side signifies the point where desire assumes the guise of an imaginary object this object is the symptomatic expression of that repressed desire and a replacement for the more primordial object that one can never possess. This primordial object that we're talking about here on the left-hand side is the desire of the other, a longing for the, a lack in the other that we cannot satisfy because we ourselves are lacking. Yet the fantasy is that we can fulfill this lack, and that's a driving force here to discover imaginary objects out there that can sustain that fantasy to give us this illusion, false illusion of wholeness that we're seeking. And so this fantasy functions as the motivating force for desire to move in its circular motion and constantly pursuing imaginary uh, substitute objects that never are the thing and thus are constantly replaced one after the one after the other, always in the form of the lowercase i parentheses a. Where the phallus functions here is where the little a is, the, the little object, the little other, operating on the register of the imaginary, uh, which in this case the phallus functions as this sort of captivating, fascinating image. An image which serves as a source for the initial identifications for the child in forming its ego. And we can see that illustrated here in the formula. Moving on to formula two, we see here represented a significant shift from the imagined to the symbolic representation of desire and the secondary identification that forms the ego ideal. So we can begin here with capital D, which stands for demand. Now, demand here is the expression of the relationship between desire and signifiers. It's also the case that desire implies a relationship to another subject, the other to whom and of whom the demand is made, but also for whom the demand makes sense. The other who, as the locus of signifiers, confers upon the demand its significance. So demand is a conditioned desire, conditioned not just by signifiers, but more precisely conditioned by the desire of the big other, the other's relation to its own desire as apprehended in the distorted field of the child's world. The demand, in fact, calls forth this desire in the other, a call to make the other's desire present. However, the response by the big other or the meaning it gives to the demand of the subject inevitably meets with varying degrees of rejection. The other is either unwilling or unable to satisfy the demand. At this point, the child faces a choice to construct a mask here at this point or to prompt the transformation of demand that results in the ego ideal. 
Lacan states that the schema that shows us that it's in the same place, depending on whether it is produced via the conscious pathway or via the unconscious pathway, that what in one case we call the ego ideal, and in the other, perversion is produced. So we can see there's this sort of crossroads between the perverse subjectivity and the subject who internalizes this ego ideal. So the ego ideal is an late identification that is linked to the transformation of desire and itself often involves a mask constructed from dissatisfaction and rejected demand. So if we consider the fact that the first formula leaves its mark within the second, the relationship with the primary object, the mother, is initially replaced by the imaginary phallus representing the mother's desire. However, the father steps in as a rival to the phallus and ultimately blocks the mother's and the child's access to it. The ego ideal itself is formed through this rivalry with the father, uh, and the child is forced to adopt the strategy of, if you can't beat them, then join them, and thus assumes the symbolic characteristics of the rival parent. This leads to the internalization of a signifier representing that parent. The child doesn't literally transform into the parent, but instead adopts signifying elements or insignias representing aspects of that parent's persona, such as their mannerisms or physical gestures. This is why the ego ideal plays a crucial role in the adoption of one's sexual identity. Formula 3 is the least clear of all here. It introduces the symbol of the phallus, and we're told here that the phallus is what introduces the relationship to the little other into the big other as the locus of speech. Now, I take this to mean that the imaginary phallus that presents an ideal of wholeness gets elevated into a symbol of lack that marks the subject. However, I think we'll better understand this as we continue through the remaining lectures, since we get not only better understanding of the function of the symbolic phallus in the next few, but also the notion of the bar that covers the big other that's shown here. Lecture 18 starts by exploring the paradoxical and perverse nature of desire, which is intrinsically tied to its concealed appearance or mask. Rather than deriving enjoyment from the object of desire, enjoyment comes from the act of desiring itself. This makes desire inherently elusive and restless as to desire something requires the desire not be fulfilled. Consequently, there's a kind of masochism that is a valid approach for preserving this desire. And this connection between desire and the symptom is highlighted as well here. And symptoms are conceived of as serving as a mask of desire. However, this mask, by subverting the satisfaction of desire, also perpetuates the state of desiring, which suggests that the mask and the desire are very intimately intertwined here. Lacan also reminds us here that symptoms are broadly defined as anything that can be analyzed, covering a wide range of manifestations, not just what we traditionally consider as symptoms. And Lacan underscores the nature of desire by separating it from love. We commonly view love and desire as unified concepts, particularly in romantic relationships. However, situations where, say, a partner cannot simultaneously love and desire their partner and then resorts to sexual gratification with a prostitute, appears to challenge this notion for Lacan, who suggests that what the subject seeks in the prostitute is the phallus, symbolizing masculinity and desire. The partner, in contrast, serves as a substitute object, fulfilling the mother's role, but lacking the element of desire the subject seeks. So the difference between love and desire here seems to be in part that love has an object, but because the object is what extinguishes desire, desire has to look elsewhere. Because desire is looking to preserve its desire. And what is the symbol of pure desiring other than the phallus itself? And where do we find this phallus? Well, we place it in some vessel that can represent it for us, in this case, the prostitute. So love and desire can be separated because the loved object of desire is distinct from the incomprehensible desire for desire. 
It's this incomprehensibility or inarticulable elements of desire that reveals how desire's intrinsic relationship with signifiers does not mean that desire always finds itself expressed through overt language. So as Wittgenstein has said, whereof one cannot speak, therefore one must be silent, the psychoanalyst might respond to this saying, silence speaks its own language, but we have to decipher it. Of course, what of desire gets articulated is demand, leading to yet another defining split in the subject between the demand that articulates desire and the unarticulated remainder that comes to form unconscious desire. We then arrive at the final lecture of this section, lecture 19, which picks up with the split between desire and demand, as well as the link between desire and its mask. We're also provided some more insight into the function of the bar as it's placed over signifiers. We see it placed in two different locations within the three formulas that we've discussed. Lacan notes that it is the signifier marked by a bar that communicates its symbolic function. The bar indicates the revocable nature of a signifier, allowing it to be isolated from the general chain and acquire a kind of independent significance. And so the phallus, which often is associated with growth, hardness, and the life force, when raised to the level of a signifier, and thus under the bar, becomes something essentially hollow, thereby linking the phallus not to fertility, but to castration, which Lacan illustrates through representations of the phallus that can be found in antiquity. He goes on to say that castration is not introduced through prohibitions, but through the perception of the mother within the symbolic order, which turns the mother into a lacking subject. And this explains why in Formula 3, the phallus is associated with the barred signifier over the letter for the big other. In perceiving the mother's castration, the child must come to terms with this lack, leading to different means to do so um, for male and female subjects, with women desiring to be the phallus in the sense of becoming a sign of what is desired, and with men seeking to possess the phallus externally, leading to a constant search for it outside the subject. However, neither men nor women can possess nor embody the phallus, and their attempts to persist in doing so is what we see reflected in the neurotic strategies of obsessional and hysteric neuroses, respectively. Hey, it's good to be back after another hiatus. Um, still transitioning into a new role, trying to figure out how to make it work um, with running the YouTube channel. I'm going to figure it away because I'm still committed to making this work. Uh, just got to figure out what's the most efficient way to get these videos out without taking shortcuts in terms of the hard work required to do an analysis. I struggled a lot with this particular portion of uh, the seminar because it's sometimes very hard to kind of create a cohesive sense of unity in when you're extracting a section within Lacan's works. That's why the, uh, the three videos that I began the seminar with were much easier than actually breaking it down into individual lectures, which, yeah, Lacan doesn't always allow for easy cohesion uh, in the narrative of his discussions from lecture to lecture. But I, I really appreciate everyone who's continued to support this work, those over on Patreon, especially those who I have here. So welcome any support I can get to help um, with this work as a thank you, as a saying, I want to see this keep going. And I'm going to, again, figure out ways in which I can make it easier for me to get these videos out, which might mean instead of cutting down on the, the quality of the content, it might mean cutting down on the degree of editing I do. Um, and so I can just get these videos out here. So we'll see how that goes. But uh, anyway, thank you for watching till the end. I'm always appreciative. I'm excited to see the channel keeps growing even when I'm not as active as I want to be and uh, looking forward to trying to turn that around. So until next video, be well.